I have a playback also, Jordan, if you want to invite me. Yes, sir. What is happening, everyone? Welcome to MLB Live Before Lock. And uh, apologies that we started a couple minutes late, but it was actually intentionally because we're, what, 30 seconds away from starting or about to begin the show here. Myself and Matt, we're talking to Jordan and everything's set and ready to go. Then all of a sudden, out of left field, the course field game gets canceled. Postponed game between the Seattle Mariners and the Colorado Rockies. And that was massively impactful for this slate because that was the team that was the Seattle Mariners at the top of our top stack odds. And then in addition to that, when I looked at my lineups through the Sims, I was just getting to a ton of Seattle Mariners. So everything ended up getting totally flipped upside down. So uh, trying to give ourselves some time here to have all the data updated and whatnot so that we could uh, really go into the show and see what it is that was going to happen in light of this. But uh, Matt, this was not something I was anticipating was even remotely a possibility. Same. I'm happy it happened early because – Clearly, it was a possibility, and I was heavily focused on this game, as we were talking about earlier. So it completely flips the slate on its head. Yeah, and I mean, I'm not even sure that this was a game that was, like, all that realistic to be canceled. I mean, I hadn't looked at the weather until, you know, I looked at it earlier, and it's like, sure, there's some rain in the forecast, but it didn't really seem all that problematic. And now, all of a sudden, the game, the game gets canceled last minute, and yeah. Rance brings it up right there, usually last minute to know. That's been my always my experience on Live Before Lockdowns, whether it's MLB or NBA. Whenever there's like massive slate breaking news, it happens the second before we're about to start the show. Just the most inconvenient, well, the actual most inconvenient time be right before the real slate starts. But for us doing content, pretty inconvenient when it happens right before the show starts. But if you guys could do us a favor as you're watching, like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Shout out to Sleeper who is sponsoring our show today. If you guys do want to sign up at Sleeper with our link, you get a deposit bonus up to $500, and they have a free square today for over under 0.5 points for De'Aaron Fox. I know this is a baseball show, but all of you guys could probably understand that De'Aaron Fox over 0.5 points is something to be taking advantage of. And then also, if you guys have any questions for us in Discord, shoot them to me. We'll answer them over the course of the show. Uh, before we start talking about the individual pitchers that we're liking for today, Matt, how do you think the Coors Field game getting canceled is going to impact your lineups? Well. I was telling you before the slate started, I was actually playing heavy on FanDuel tonight because I love the Coors game. I know the weather wasn't great, but really good ownership and bad pitching on both sides. Much easier to get there on FanDuel. On DK with the pricing and the lack of like viable cheap pitching options, I found it really hard to get to. So did the field. So both offenses were coming in with not a ton of ownership, especially Colorado. 
So as far as affecting the slate, I really just think like a lot of the Seattle ownership goes to Baltimore and then a couple of the other good teams on the slate, maybe Atlanta, but Colorado wasn't getting much ownership for me personally. It changes everything. Yeah. For me as well. If you guys watched the strategy show that I did this morning with Lofty, I'd said at the time that I had Seattle stacks in two thirds of my lineups and that's more or less what I still had when I re-ran everything closer to lock. So I've got stuff that are being rerun right now, but it is still kind of a base version of my lineups because we are going to have updated ownership projections and player projections as we get. Well, the player projections won't change as a result of this. The ownership certainly will. And I'm curious to see where that changes certain players because even the pitchers, I think the pitchers are going to end up changing a decent amount as a result of this. Definitely because the price against Seattle was so tough. Now I think the expensive pitchers get more ownership. Yeah, and well, Seattle, at least on DraftKings, wasn't all that expensive. I think there was only two players in the lineup, maybe even one that was more expensive than $5,000. Like the Rockies were expensive. They were a team I was trying to get to. And yeah, I do wonder, does this mean potentially that, not that they were like crazy expensive, but you couldn't roster just only expensive pitchers with them. Maybe Clark Schmidt becomes less popular, something along those lines. But do you envision now like the Freddie Peralta and the other payout pitchers do become more popular without the Coors game? A little bit because like, yeah, even though Seattle wasn't super expensive, they weren't cheap. Like Julio was close to 6K, Crawford 4,500. Like they had some cheap guys sprinkled in, but the guys you want were decently expensive. So yeah, I think with people off of Julio, who is projected to be one of the highest owned bats, I think that ownership will just go towards probably the pitching because there are no sure offensive spots. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's see if we have any questions coming to us from discord. If not, we could start talking about the pitching options and no specific questions that we have as of now, but let's go ahead and look at the pitchers. And for starters here, are you going to be prioritizing the high end pitchers more than you might've before the show started because of the course game being canceled? Yes, personally for me, because I was also on the Rockies. And as you mentioned, they were more expensive than Seattle. So I was prioritizing this game over pitching. Now, I'm not sure there's an offensive spot that I think is worthy of that. So while there aren't pitchers I like love on this slate, I like Sale, I like Peralta. And while I what might forgo playing them with the Coors game, I don't know if an offensive spot is worth that now. So yeah, I do think so for me. How about you? Yeah, I'm I'm interested to see. I'm running one more sim here and it actually just finished and I could pull up what my picture, my, my pitcher exposures ended up being. And yeah, I mean, the one thing that's changed most notably for me is I do have a lot more of Joe Ryan now, which I think that's a couple of things. Number one is the way my lineups were constructed earlier. While well, I was getting to Joe Ryan, I had less of them than what the field had. But one thing that was kind of a result of that is I was playing a very chalky Seattle offense because it just projected so much better than everything else in the Sims tool and the top stacks tool. So what ended up happening was the Sims were saying like, hey, if Seattle is the preeminent spot on the slate and they're going to be somewhat popular, you got to get a little bit different with your pitching. So the biggest difference I'm noticing immediately here is Joe Ryan, who if I could only roster one pitcher on the slate relative to his salary and if we're taking ownership out of the equation, Joe Ryan is the guy. I think he's the cash game pitcher to play on Fandle for DraftKings. You want to play him in cash games as well as tournaments. But because he is right around 40% owned, I was coming in underweight to the field to him. That's not the case anymore because now I'm at 58% Joe Ryan, whereas earlier I had about 30% of Joe Ryan. Right, because now, like I, it's kind of goes hand in hand with what I just said. Now you're more apt to spread around your offenses because there isn't an offense like Seattle for Colorado that looks so good in the top stack tool and isn't getting ownership like those other teams were. So I'm with you. Yeah. And if we look at all of the pay up options on this slate as a whole, let's group all of the guys. Cause th there's this really big gap in the pricing on DraftKings where you've got Tristan McKenzie is $8,700. And then you get an $800 gap between you get to, before you get to a uh, Clark Schmidt there at 7,900. So let's look at all of the pitchers, 8,700 to the top of the price range at $9,600. That's also where all of the chalk is today. Although there is, you know, some ownership going to Jack Flaherty. So maybe I'll, I'll hold, uh, other than Jack Flaherty, all of the pitchers that are picking up ownership are the expensive ones. 
And uh, once again, this is going to change a little bit as we get uh, updated ownership projection for the uh, course field game being canceled. But still, the popular pitchers are still going to be the popular pitchers. And of the pitchers that are 8,700 or more, we've got Joe Ryan is now 45% owned. Chris Sale is 28% owned. Freddie Peralta is 34%. And then you got like Yamamoto right around 10%. Blake Snell around 10%. But everything else pretty contrarian beyond that. So let's start with the chalk options. Between Freddie Peralta, Chris Sale, and Joe Ryan, how would you rank these guys? Which is your favorite of the chalk pitchers? Which is the one that you're lukewarm on? And which is your least favorite? We got three really popular pitchers at the high end. Well, I'll say this before even answering this. There isn't any of them I'm like lukewarm on or don't like. It's just okay. who I like best. My favorite sale. Highest pitcher, you know, highest graded pitcher in our top pitcher tool, getting less ownership than Peralta or Ryan. I know it's a tough matchup, but just ultimate K upside. He's looked good to start the year. A lot of the underlying numbers are really good with him. So sales, my favorite. Then I don't really have a preference between Peralta and Ryan. I guess if Forrest, I'd go Ryan two, Peralta three, just because of the price tag. Good matchup with Detroit. Burned me the other day, not playing Ryan in this spot. So I know the ownership's just going to be crazy with him and the higher dollar stuff. And I get it. He's too cheap, but. I don't think there's much of a difference between him and Peralta. And I do think there'll be an ownership gap. So while I like Ryan more, it's by a slight margin. So sale, Ryan, Peralta. How about you? Sounds like Ryan number one for you. So uh, one thing I'm also going to note is that we did just get updated ownership projections for the Coors Field game being canceled. So I'm also reviewing that. I just realized that the ownership projections I'd read out before were still with that game in our projection. So it's moved a little bit, but not anything too significant at the pitchers as far as ownership. We do have Joe Ryan is now 42% on Chris Sale, 25%, Frey Peralta at 34%. As far as my pitcher exposures, here's how I have these guys ordered. I get to Joe Ryan the most. I'm a, a little bit overweight to the field to him. Then I get Chris Sale. Relative to what his projected ownership is, I'm the most overweight to him, even though I have more of Joe Ryan. It's also Joe Ryan's a lot more popular. And then I am underweight to the field on Freddie Peralta at the moment. Now, I don't dislike any of these pitchers, like you had said. Just those are the orders I'm getting to them as far as exposures go. And I do consider Joe Ryan against the, against the Tigers the safest pitcher that we have on the high end today. Uh, Chris Sale and Freddie Peralta probably each have a little bit more upside considering their strikeout stuff, even though Joe Ryan has struck out a lot of hitters this year. But also, we do have a considerably tougher matchup for Chris Sale than the other pitchers. And then Freddie Peralta also is going to be pitching on the road against the St. Louis Cardinals. But that's how we order them, those three in that order. Now, if I was building a cash game lineup right now on DraftKings, I would go to Joe Ryan and Freddie Peralta as my cash game options. I agree. Uh I don't think you're crazy to go sail over Peralta, but I do think that Ryan is the number one guy in cash. Yeah, and then Freddie Peralta, just because of his matchup being against the Cardinals, whereas, you know, Chris Sale pitching against the Rangers, that being a matchup that is, you know, a difficult. They won the World Series last year. This is still one of the, you know, best overall offenses in baseball. Just because of how difficult this matchup is, it does a couple of things. Number one, it lowers his ownership. That makes him appealing for tournaments. But for cash games, it does make him a little bit unsafe to where I wouldn't play him in a cash game setting. Just, you know, different kinds of uh, tournaments we're looking at or different uh, settings, I should say, cash games versus tournaments. Whereas Fandle, we only have to roster one pitcher. I'll say Joe Ryan is the go-to in cash games. Of these pay-up options, Matt, who is your favorite pivot to get to for tournament purposes? Uh, probably a split between Yamamoto and McKenzie. Yamamoto has really high strikeout upside in any matchup he's in. He obviously has trouble just throwing so many pitches. This Mets lineup, while not extremely potent, doesn't strike out a lot. And it's not bad either. McKenzie gets the premier matchup but you're getting Oakland on the road. You know, he's obviously got that torn ligament, decided not to get surgery on. He hasn't been good to start the year. He missed almost the entire year last year. Big, big risks with him, but no ownership. I mean, him and Yamamoto have basically the exact same score in the top pitcher tool, and McKenzie's coming in with a third of the ownership. So I think if you're talking about just straight, like, contrarian pivot, it's McKenzie. Yeah, it's... 
it's so difficult for me to get to McKenzie because on one hand, I understand he's got a good matchup. He's a pitcher who's got arm talent, even if we haven't seen it so far this year. And he's got, once again, a matchup against the Oakland A's. The problem I have with McKenzie, beyond just what his results have been so far this year, it's really what you had mentioned there. And it is, he's, he's got the elbow injury. It seems like he needs Tommy John surgery at some point. He's trying to put it off. It kind of seems inevitable. He was only able to make four starts last year, pitch 16 innings. He's made three starts this year. And it's not just the results, like I said, but the underlying numbers. His average fastball velocity is 91 miles per hour. When he was healthy, it was 93. I don't think he's healthy. He's not throwing strikes. He's not generating swing and misses. He's an 8.1% strikeout rate, a 19.4% walk rate. Now, would this be his results over an entire season? No, they're like unrealistically terrible, but I don't think he's healthy. And that's also kind of hard to project for. I agree. I'm not going to go as far as to say, like, I know he needs the surgery because there are pitchers that have pitched well and not gotten it. Aaron Nola. I know Tanaka Tanaka. for the Yankees. Yeah, Tanaka. We just said that at the same time. But you're right. Those are few and far between. Like, a lot of people around here are upset he didn't get the surgery last year. We'll see. I think McKenzie's interesting just because of the tools. Like, if I didn't know anything about baseball, he'd really stand out. You know what I mean? So there's that. But I also think based on what you said, the Oakland stack is really in play for me also, mm-hmm. especially if I were playing a ton of lineups. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into that. In a, yeah. In a uh, and uh, actually, I'm looking at my exposures right now because I've looked at my pitcher exposure while we're talking about it, but I haven't really closely reviewed my stack exposure since I've re-ran everything for the quarters game. I knew it was going to be wildly different because – you know, if I had two thirds of my lineups were a Mariners stack that doesn't exist on this slate anymore, uh, there are going to be other teams that have to just pop up by necessity. And Oakland actually is a team I'm getting to a good amount of stacks of. So that is something to talk about in a little bit. For me, as far as contrarian pitching options go here, I'm interested in Blake Snell, who is coming off the Cy Young winning year, but his underlying numbers didn't match the actual results. There was certainly regression that was expected to come in the future. And it's one of the main reasons that Blake Snell didn't get signed in the offseason is Boris is saying, hey, Blake Snell is a Cy Young winner. Give him Cy Young money. And every team is going like, nah, we don't really think that he's worth that kind of money because we thought last year was a little bit fluky. And it's it's kind of the now the the meeting between what teams used to value in the past and what players and agents would look for on the free agent market First, now teams valuing some of the advanced stats more and saying like, hey, the predictive data shows that Blake Snell had an outlier season last year and it's not expected to continue. And now he has a season where he gets signed right before the season starts. He doesn't really have any sort of ramp up period. He starts the year in the minor leagues, gets called up and wasn't totally stretched out. So we've seen him not go deep into games. We've seen him struggle in the early going. I do think sooner rather than later, though, we're going to see good starts out of Blake Snell. And throughout his career, even in some of his down years, he's always consistently been a guy who could maintain a strikeout rate right around 30%. And when you consider that we've got Blake Snell at 10% ownership, and now also it's going to be even easier to pay up for pitching, you get a 10% owned Blake Snell, who before you had mentioned, Matt, uh, about... Chris Sale and the fact that he has top two pitcher odds that are better than pitchers like Freddie Peralta and Joe Ryan at lower ownership. Well, Blake Snell is a 20.3% chance to be one of the top two scoring pitchers on the slate in the top pitchers tool. Chris Sale at 21.2%. So you got Blake Snell, who's comparable to all the other popular pitchers. It's just a fraction of the ownership. So you're right. And that's why I wrote up Blake Snell today as my contrarian pitcher on DraftKings. Mm -hmm. It's another one though. It's not, the risks are different than McKenzie. Like, obviously, you trust going forward, Snell will be his old self sooner rather than later. But he hasn't looked it. He's expensive. And he's in a really tough spot. I mean, you talked about this Rangers offense. The team they played was the Diamondbacks. And especially against left-handed pitching, like, they're really, really good. So, I think that Snell and McKenzie are more similar on this slate than maybe I thought going in just in terms of they both come with ultimate risk. And at the end of the day, actually more interested in stacking Oakland than Arizona, just because Snell's not usually a guy that gets blown up. That said, he did last time out. So just an interesting slate in that regard. 
Got a couple questions from Discord, and then we'll start talking about some of the cheaper pitching options to be getting to today. First, hey, I'm Drew. Wants to know who is the ranch play tonight? Somebody who's getting a lot of hype, but you just don't see it. This is a callback to our strategy show this morning. Who starting at, and it could be an offense, whether it's a pitcher or an offense on the slate, Matt. What's a spot that you just think is picking up too much ownership? Probably, you know what? I'm going to say Joe Ryan. Like, I get it because of the price, but look at our top pitcher tool. He's right in the middle of the guys we're talking about, and he's getting double the ownership of basically everyone else. So, Joe Ryan. Yeah, I'm going to say Freddie Peralta, 34.4% ownership. It's one thing I don't hate Freddie Peralta. I have around 20% of him, but it's just less than what the field has. So I do think that he's over-owned relative to where the field is getting to him. And then uh, Noah, 4048, he wants to know a player to maybe ROI boost or de-boost for today's slate. If you had to force yourself to get to a particular pitcher, and then we'll do it for a stack as well, what would be a pitcher? that you would try to just boost to make them get into more lineups. Cause I think that's Blake Snell for me. That's a tough one. Um, probably sale. The other guy I like that's getting no ownership is Manaya. Um, he's also expensive. So it's like tough to say he's a better play than someone like Joe Ryan, but the ownership discount is just so massive that, he comes into play for me. Ultimately, though, I'll say Sale. I just like him as the best pitcher on the slate. Yeah, Blake Snell for uh, for myself. And then, yeah, no, we'll, we'll talk about offenses when we get there. But for pitching, that's the way I would go if I was trying to uh, give myself somebody and uh, get overweight to them more aggressively than the Sims otherwise would be. And then if we look at the cheaper pitchers, Matt, we've only got, let's see now, the updated – projections we only got one pitcher project for north of 15 percent ownership that's priced under 8k that's jack flaherty jack flaherty projected for 29.7 percent ownership against the minnesota twins We've got kyle gibson projected for 10 percent ownership clark schmidt 14.8 percent those are it those are your only three pitchers that are even project for double digit ownership for cheap and then we've got a uh, flaherty the most popular one at 29.7 percent so let's start by talking about jack flaherty if you had to punt well, not necessarily punt, but if you're just saving salary with any one of these pitchers that sub 8K, would you go to Jack Flaherty as the chalk or is there somebody else you would you would prefer to get to? Man, I don't love Flaherty at that ownership. I'm just not sure there's anyone I like better. At the end of the day, though, I'll choose someone else just because it's not Jack Flaherty at that ownership level. So maybe Clark Schmidt against Tampa. Maybe Gibson against the Milwaukee. I don't hate that either. Um, you know what you're signing up for when you play a guy like Gibson. So it's, you're never excited. But on this slate at 7,300, I think it's Gibson. It doesn't feel good, but it's Gibson. Yeah, I, I'm i going to go with Clark Schmidt here. And there's a couple of reasons to be going with Clark Schmidt. Uh, most notably, projections, we do have them projected ahead of Jack Flaherty. Very similar, very, very similar in terms of the top pitcher odds. But still, Clark Schmidt does come out a little bit ahead of Flaherty. Flaherty's also really struggled, not just this year, but low-key. If you look at Jack Flaherty's numbers, I was kind of digging into them with Lafayette earlier today. The entirety of Flaherty's career, and once again, he's not unplayable against the Tigers. I'm just going to make a case for why Clark Schmidt is a good pivot. He's not really been good for a meaningful amount of time, Jack Flaherty. If you look at his numbers so far this year, it's the Fangraphs page is loading for me. He's a 4.91 ERA, 3.85 expected ERA. Not great, not totally terrible either, but overall, like once again, just not very great. Last year, he had a 4.99 ERA, a 5.06 expected ERA. In 2022, a 4.25 ERA, 4.94 expected ERA. In 2021, a 3.22 ERA. All right, that's good. But still a 4.89 expected ERA. In 2020, a 4.91 expected ERA, a 5 point, uh, sorry, 4.91 real ERA, 5.03 expected ERA. He has not actually had a year where his wins above replacement would categorize him as even a mid-rotation starter since 2019. That's been a very long time since Jack Flaherty's actually been good. And he has some name value because of how good he was when he first broke into the big leagues and he was one of the top pitching prospects. 
I don't know. The more I look at Jack Flaherty's numbers, I'm just kind of questioning, like, is this guy even really all that good at all? He's got a decent matchup, but I don't know if he individually is actually good. Yeah, I agree with you. I think there's a lot of unknown there, and I emphasize the a lot. And with that in mind, you got a pitcher in Clark Schmidt, who I think is probably comparable to a real-life pitcher as Jack Flaherty. Sure, he's $200 more expensive. He's got an okay matchup at home against the Tampa Bay Rays, but you're also getting him for about half of the ownership of Jack Flaherty. I just don't think Jack Flaherty is going to outscore Clark Schmidt at a two to one rate on this slate. So if I'm looking for a pivot here, it is going to be Clark Schmidt for myself. I know you mentioned Kyle Gibson as a potential pivot. Also, I, I think with the course field gone, you don't have to target anybody in this, in this low price range of pitchers. And that's something else that we should talk on as well is, do you think you have to roster any of these cheap guys? Definitely not. Certainly don't have to because, you know, now you don't have the offenses that you really like need to spend up for. That said, Atlanta's expensive. The Dodgers are expensive. Those teams are always going to be in play. So one of these pitchers down here, one or more, probably going to pitch well. I just don't know who it's going to be, and I'm probably not going to take those risks. Yeah, and then also if you go ahead and look at some of the other pitchers that are available for cheap, None of them are picking up ownership because they're pretty shitty options. I talked about how there's only these three pitchers that even have double-digit ownership, Matt. The next most popular pitcher for cheap is Dean Kramer at 7% ownership. And then there's not another pitcher, sub 8K, that even has more than 2% ownership. Is there anybody else you have your eye on for cheap that's uh, not picking up ownership? Any crazy contrarian options? One guy that I was at least looking at before the slate started is Yariel Rodriguez. Cuban de facto. Didn't pitch at all last year. Pitched out of the bullpen in 22. Certainly not going to throw a ton of pitches here, but looked good in his Blue Jays debut. They signed him to a decent amount of money. I don't think they expected him to be in the rotation this soon, but he's got a live arm. My biggest problem is he has a 0.0% chance of being a a top two pitcher and 2.4% ownership. So ultimately, I probably won't get down here at all. How about yourself? Yeah, I don't think I'm going to play other than like a guy who might show up in like a lineup or two in the Sims. Like I'm not going to have a meaningful amount of any of these cheap pitchers other than like Clark Schmidt will show up in some lineups. Flaherty will in some, Gibson will in some. I do expect them to be underweight to all of them. And then nothing else a priority of any of the other cheap guys. They all suck. Yeah, it makes sense. Same. We've got a question. Oh, no, that was the question before that we already answered. Uh, but we did have a super chat here. This one is coming to us from Ace of Spade. He wants us to go take a look at DK tiers. So, yes, let's look at the tier slate, which I've pulled up in front of me here. Now, keep in mind that there is no Coors Field game to consider anymore. I think I remember, which was it? Tier, yeah, tier three had a bunch of players in the Coors Field game. And there was also Coors Field players in Tier 4, Tier 5, and Tier 6. So starting with Tier 1, where we are going to be able to make some stacks amongst our tiers today, I'm going to start here. Did you look over tiers at all, Matt? If not, I could just kind of run over some of the ones I liked. You got it. All right. So Tier 1, I like Ronald Acuna. You can make brave stacks in tiers. I think that's a very, very favorable way to build your tiers lineups. They're going to go against Andrew Heaney, who is a very boomer bust pitcher. Andrew Heaney, and he's been more bust than boom, particularly this year. The way Andrew Heaney goes, though, is his at-bats are either he gives up a home run or he strikes somebody out or he walks. Like, there just aren't that many balls put in play against Heaney. He's kind of like what people think of as Joey Gallo as a hitter, either home run, walk, or strikeout. Heaney's managed to do that as a pitcher while still being successful. So some pretty bizarre outcomes that we've seen from Heaney over the years. This is just a brutal matchup for him against the Atlanta Braves. So I like being able to stack the Braves. You could go Acuna in Tier 1. You could go Austin Riley in Tier 2. You could go Marcelo Zuna in Tier 3. And then you've also got in Tier 5, Michael Harris. So that's a four-man Brave stack that you can make in tiers. And then for some of the other options that I like in Tier 4, Tier four is a tough one, like, because this is one where I probably would have gone to the Seattle Mariners and gone to Jorge Polanco. Now that he's not an option, I'm going to look at Marcus Semien in tier four. And then in tier six, I'll go with Giancarlo Stanton because he's going up against the lefty and Alexander. 
but uh, not really great stacking options in the other tiers. So load up on the Braves, then fill in the other tiers how you see fit there, Ace of Spade. And thank you very much for the super chat there. Uh, before we move on to stacks, Matt, do you have anything else to add about the pitchers? I don't think so. All right, Jordan, if you wouldn't mind, can you pull up the lineup generator? Let's build some lineups in the lineup generator and see what's popping up there. And if you guys want to sign up for the lineup generator or any other MLB packages that we have, it is going to get you access to our Discord. Try and get signed up for those links right below. Right, If you're watching on YouTube, links right below in the description box. You'll see our data package. You'll see our Sims package. You'll see our lineup generator package. You sign up for any of those using those links. And once again, all of them include Discord access. We also currently have a deal going on for the NBA playoffs, where if you sign up using one of the links that we have below, you get 50% off a Sims weekly package. So if you stop playing NBA because the end of the NBA regular season is, well, the end of the NBA regular season, what happens with that, and you want to get back into it for the playoffs, sign up using the link we have below. Promo code playoffs to get yourself 50% off. Uh, and now let's build some lineups in the MLB lineup gen here and see what's popping up. We'll build lineups for DraftKings. We'll build lineups for FanDuel as well. But let's start with DK and uh, go all stack types, Jordan. And go balance lineups. I'm kind of curious to see what ends up popping up because it is not just going to be the aggressive Coors Field game like it was going to be earlier. So let's see what we end up getting to here. And then we'll look at the pitcher exposures, the hitter exposures, the stack exposures and see what's really looking good. All right, so starting with the pitchers, Joe Ryan, a lot of him, a lot of Freddie Peralta, getting to Chris Sale, getting to Jack Flaherty, getting to Blake Snell. So we're getting to a lot of the chalk guys, but one thing that kind of does make me feel good here, we are 3x the field on Blake Snell, so the lineup generator is identifying him as a contrarian pitcher to be getting to. And then the chalk guys just kind of showing up about even with the field on them. I don't have any sort of real massive issues with that. Click on the stack exposures here, Jordan. I want to see what stacks we got the most of. Yeah, so only three stacks showing up predominantly on DK, Matt. The Blue Jays, the Braves, the Orioles. Of those stacks, do you dislike any of them? Or are there any, and uh, by the way, Max Video said, is that DK or FanDuel? These are the DK lineups now, and then we're going to build FanDuel lineups here in you know, a couple minutes after we break down the uh, DK ones. Uh, so these are DK stacks, Toronto, Atlanta, Baltimore. Do any of these teams surprise you? No, not even a little bit. Atlanta looks great. They always do. You talked about Heaney. They're expensive, so their ownership is low. Baltimore is not expensive, so their ownership is not low. But they look like the best team on the slate. They're the only team getting double-digit ownership. And then Toronto's like next in line. They're even cheaper than Baltimore. Not getting as much love, though. So they're also a little bit over-owned, but... Them, Atlanta, and and uh, Baltimore look like three of the top teams on the slate. Yeah, and uh, by the way, uh, Fablominius, I, I always feel like I pronounced that incorrectly in the uh, in the playback chat over there. But Fablominius asked us, uh, why do the Sims like Toronto? They aren't hitting the ball all that good de- uh, recently. First, that doesn't really matter all that much. It's 162 game baseball season. If a team has been, you know, bad over a week or two weeks, it's not indicative of what's going to happen going forward. There's a lot of randomness over 162 game season. So I wouldn't look at recent results to make any kind of uh, determinations about whether you should or shouldn't play anything from baseball, unless there's something underlying. Like if there's a pitcher who's had some bad outings and then you look at his velocity and it's way down, it could be indicative of something else. But I wouldn't just strictly look at, results from the last week or so be like, Hey, this team's no good. Therefore I'm not playing them. Here's where it's kind of funny though, because the blue Jays haven't been good recently, they get priced down on DraftKings, And then as a result, they end up projecting really good. And also their ownership is a little bit lower as a result of the not playing as well recently. So you got a Toronto blue Jays team that's picking up 8% projected ownership, which it's something it's not nothing, but also they have the second highest top value odds of any team on the slate. And considering that Matt and I just talked about pitchers, we talked about how much we like getting to some of the high-end guys. You have to find bats that are going to fit with the high-end pitchers. And you could build Toronto stacks pretty easily that fit with the top-end pitchers. So it's pricing more than anything that will dictate getting to Toronto. And let me see my current run here. I have the Blue Jays or my most rostered stack right now. For large field tournaments, it does look like the Blue Jays are going to be the team that I get to the most. That's also what's showing up in the lineup generator here. If you were picking one team to roster in a large field tournament, would it be Toronto or would it be somebody else? It wouldn't be Toronto. Like, I get your points. I just do think the ownership is going to be a tad high. Honestly, I'm going to go back to a team we talked about earlier, Oakland. Ownership is low. 
they have a crazy chance of being the top value stack on the board, 16.5% chance. We spoke on McKenzie's troubles. Give me Oakland. Yeah, I like Oakland as a contrarian team as well. It's not going to be like my most stacked team or anything like that, but I'm crazy overweight to the Oakland days right now, which I'm happy when the data aligns with what some of my other ideas are as far as the slate goes. Then Atlanta, Baltimore, the other teams we're getting to here. So let's go back to checking the player exposures, Jordan, and then we'll build lineups for FanDuel right after this. So if we're looking at the player exposures, once again, a lot of individual hitters here coming from Toronto, Dalton Varsho. We've got Isaiah Kiner-Falefa showing up in a bunch of lineups. Orlando Arcia, Danny Jensen, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., who's still only $4,800. And because we have other guys like Varsho, $3,200. Kiner-Falefa is 2300 Danny Jensen is 3300 It's what we were talking about before. It's so easy to make Blue Jay stacks and pay up for whatever pitching that you want. And then if we scroll down, a little bit further there, I see Adam Duvall popping up. I really do like Adam Duvall as a one-off. And then uh, Bo Bichette showing up in lineups there. So there's an overview of what the lineup generator is liking for FanDuel. So let's go ahead and check out the FanDuel side of things and see what's popping up on FanDuel next, Jordan. Let's go to the lineup generator. FanDuel, same deal. Let's go all stack types and balance lineups. And once again, to reiterate, these are going to be FanDuel lineups that we're building out in this portion. And if you guys do sign up for the lineup generator, it does include access to both FanDuel and DraftKings. You could save lineups you like, discard lineups you don't like. You could export them in a CSV and upload them directly to FanDuel and DraftKings. Uh, for people who are asking me if the Baltimore game is playing, there's like no rain in the forecast. So I don't see a reason it wouldn't. <laughs> But with that said, I thought the Seattle and Colorado, yeah, at least Co Seattle and Colorado had some rain in the forecast. Not that I thought it was going to be canceled, but like there's nothing really right now that seems problematic in the Baltimore game. But uh, immediately, the first thing I noticed about the FanDuel lineups, a lot of your Cleveland Guardians, Matt. So this is uh, definitely different looking exposures than what we were getting to over on DraftKings. As far as the pitchers go, it's also very spread out here. I see Chris Sale is our most rostered pitcher at 26% on FanDuel. Scroll down a little bit more here, Jordan. One other thing that could kind of be interesting that somebody brought up in the YouTube chat, I don't know if you noticed this, Matt, but uh, FanDuel, because people were wondering, is Freddie Peralta not starting anymore because FanDuel doesn't have him listed as the starter? I, don't, I wonder who they do have listed. But uh, yeah, for whatever reason, FanDuel, and why you guys should never get your news from FanDuel or DraftKings, they don't have Peralta listed as the starter. Who do they have? No. They have... So they actually don't have anybody listed. Oh, they have, uh, that's weird. They have DL Hall listed as the starting pitcher on FanDuel. If you guys are looking at that, it is incorrect. Freddie Peralta is expected to be the starter. Uh, but anyway, as far as our pitcher exposures, Chris Sale, Kyle Gibson, Clark Schmidt. Freddie Peralta is also crazy expensive on FanDuel, which does make him a little bit hard to get to. Blake Snell in 15% of lineups. I'm kind of surprised we're not seeing Joe Ryan show up here yet. see was did i just uh no there's jack flaherty yeah there's joe ryan only an eight percent of lineups so they come in a little bit underweight to uh, joe ryan he's ten thousand two hundred on fanduel so it makes him a lot more expensive relatively than what he is on DraftKings. uh but still i thought he would show up in a little bit more of those lineups as far as our stack exposures atlanta cleveland those are the two teams we have the most exposure to what do you make of them as fanduel specific stacks matt i don't mind it i think it's just a pricing thing ownership is as we're seeing, aside from Baltimore on both sites, spread out. Atlanta will be the team that people want to pay off for. And Cleveland's just a lot easier to get to on FanDuel, facing a true unknown in Joe Boyle, who's had a couple of real good starts and at least one horrific start. So I get it. And as far as Baltimore goes, a lot of people are going to want to stack them on FanDuel, which I understand. It is just too much ownership for me. We've got Baltimore projected for 17% ownership on FanDuel. That is a crazy amount of ownership going to a team not playing in course field. Agreed. Yeah, so Baltimore, not a priority for me on FanDuel just because of what their ownership is. We have them as, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's the most negatively leveraged team we've had of the entire year. And once again, not that we don't project them decently. We have them at the second highest top stack odds, but a team with a 10.3% chance being the highest scoring team on this league just doesn't really warrant 17% exposure over on FanDuel. Uh, Guardians, that is a more contrarian team, 8.5% projected ownership there as a squad. So Cleveland Guardians showing up in some lineups. I'll click on the player exposures here, Jordan, and we'll look at what we're getting to individually. 
Yeah, so hitters, and no surprise, this correlates pretty heavily with the teams we're stacking, but Austin Riley, Aaron Judge looks really good as a one-off. Surprisingly, only $3,800 starting against a lefty. I can't remember the last time Aaron Judge was regularly this cheap over on FanDuel. And then uh, the rest of it, just players in our stacks. Andres Jimenez, Ronald Acuna, Orlando Arcia, Stephen Kwan, Jose Ramirez, uh, Josh Naylor, Adam Duvall, Michael Harris. So it is all players that correlate with our stacks. And then Aaron Judge as a one-off. Anything else that you're noticing here that you want to talk about? No, Judge was one of the biggest pricing misnomers on the entire slate on either site. Uh, way too cheap on Fandle. Yeah, agreed. He should uh, very rarely be, well, actually really ever be sub 4K. Like maybe if he's facing like prime Nolan Ryan in the polo grounds, which were like, what was polo grounds? Right. Like 580 feet <laughs> to center field or something like that. Maybe they'd be like, yeah, not, not all that inclined to uh, to get to a really expensive Aaron Judge. But other than that, because those situations don't exist anymore, probably not really want to uh, have a site pricing Aaron Judge at $3,800. Uh, all we're at 14, said I came in late. Is Seattle, Colorado postponed? Yes, it is off the slate. It is no longer an option, which makes this show massively different from the strategy show this morning. If you guys haven't done yet, do us a favor, like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you have any questions for us in Discord, at me, so we could answer those over the course of the show. Uh, but let's start looking at some of the other stacks here now, Matt. We've gone through the lineup generator. Let's look at the slate as a whole, and let me refresh to make sure there haven't been any ownership changes here, and there have not been. So on the DraftKings side of things, here is where we stand on the current updated ownership. The Baltimore Orioles are 17% owned on FanDuel, 15% on DraftKings. What do you make of all the ownership going to Baltimore? I mean... I get it. When I first looked at this slate, I was like, man, considering the weather, Baltimore looks like maybe the best stack on the board. And then you look at the tools and I'm not the only one that feels that way, especially considering we've got expensive pitchers. The field is going to be really concentrated on Baltimore in like the higher dollar, you know, lower entry type stuff or lower field type stuff. So I'll stay away from them, but it's a risky fade. I mean, there just aren't offenses that look great on this slate and they look like the best of the bunch. So I get the ownership, but it's too, it's too much. Yeah. That's where I'm at as well with the Orioles. Let me see. What did I get? And my last run of Sims, I have 10% Orioles stack. So it's not like an outright fade. It's just, a, you know, it's two thirds of what the field has. So I'm going to be underweight to this Baltimore team not because they look bad or anything like that. They just look a little bit over So I'll be a little bit underweight to them as a result of that. The teams that I'm getting the most exposure to, I've got three teams. I mentioned I've got Baltimore 10%. I've got three teams with more than 10% exposure in my stack portfolio here, Matt. Would you like to guess which three teams they are? Yeah, I would. Uh, you said, so these are the three teams you have the most exposure to? Yes. Okay, so not compared to the field, just the straight most exposure to. Yeah, just just flat out most exposure. Toronto. Yep, they're number one for me, seventeen percent. Atlanta. Number three, I got them eleven and a half percent. The Dodgers. No, actually, I thought you were going to get this one because I, I it's Oakland it my hand and said it before. It's Oakland. Oakland okay. against Tristan McKenzie. This is a team that we have projected for 4% ownership, so pretty low mark on them. They also have the highest top value odds on the slate, and this is not a vote of confidence for the Oakland A's. It is very far removed from a vote of confidence in the Oakland A's. What it is, though, is just a bet on the possibility that the cheapest offense on the slate, which warrants to be cheap on every single slate, is going up against a pitcher in Tristan McKenzie who just might be shot right now. Not guaranteed that he shot, but I do think it's one of the more likely scenarios right now is that Tristan McKenzie isn't healthy. That's why his velocity is so far down this year. And it could be something that he's just going to require surgery for later on in the year. But considering where the ownership is, like the field isn't playing McKenzie. The field isn't playing Oakland. I, I think there's upside in one of these sides. It's hard for me to see a scenario where there is no upside in Oakland or McKenzie. I, I agree. And the other thing about Oakland that I like, not only are they far and away the, the team to have the top value stack a large percentage of the time. The ownership's not there. There's a lot of unknown in McKenzie. 
and they get a huge ballpark upgrade. So like, I know the weather's not great here and Cleveland's not the best place to hit. It's a hell of a lot better than Oakland at night. So there's a lot to like about Oakland. If you're willing to take the risk, knowing like they suck. And if McKenzie's right, he'll probably mow them down. But if he's not, these are still major league hitters that have won slates in the past. So I'm with you. Like they make a lot of sense to me. I just had a brain fart. Why I didn't say them? Cause I definitely knew it was Oakland after talking about it with you the entire show. Yeah. And uh, by the way, yeah, I thought you were going to get that one for sure, but you know, it happened. you threw me an, uh, alley, an easy here. alley-oop and I just <laughs> missed the dunk. <laughs> Uh, you, you got the harder ones, though. You got the ones I didn't tell you about. So that was uh, maybe mind mind reading going on there. Uh, but we do have a uh, Stephen Leibowitz said, and I think this is a good point. Uh, one thing that could cap Oakland is the Guardians have a pretty good bullpen. Yes, especially at the back end, they have an elite bullpen. Here's where, though, I think that matters a little bit less for the upside of stacks. Because if you're stacking a team and you're looking for the utmost ceiling possible, what you kind of do need to happen is for them to really rough up the starting pitcher. And in a scenario where the starting pitcher gets his ass kicked and Oakland puts up big runs, well, then the Guardians aren't going to go to their top-end arms at the end of the game anyway. So what you're hoping for here is that if those arms ever do end up coming in, the Oakland stack was probably screwed to begin with anyway. So you kind of need them to put up a crooked number on the board early against McKenzie. If they're not getting to McKenzie early in the game, then yeah, they're not getting to the Guardians' bullpen late. Does, does that all follow? 100% follows. And honestly, that's the truth with most teams. Most teams, you know, they're at least, you know, they, they might have to ha- might not have good bullpens like Cleveland, but all teams are going to have better guys for the high leverage type situation. So I'm with you. Let's look at some of the other offenses uh, on the slate here. And then also kind of specifically talking about single entry. Considering the outlook of the slate right now, Matt, we've talked about some large field stuff, but if you're playing one lineup right at this moment, what would be the stack you would go with? So I like Oakland. That's a, I'm not sure the answer to that question because a lot of it depends on what pitchers you use. Mm-hmm. But the three right now that stand out to me as far as who I like in the tools, Oakland, the Yankees, and Tampa Bay. Yeah, if I was picking one right now, it probably would be Oakland. It's the team I'm most overweight to. So I think Oakland would be the choice. If not Oakland, uh, it certainly wouldn't be Baltimore. They're picking up so much ownership. Here's a question for you. With all the ownership going to Baltimore, do you think that they're going to – because it's kind of a weird spot. Like, I understand why they're popular. just so much more ownership than I expected – do you think this team is going to be like the, the normal rule of thumb we use as we look at the most popular stack and we consider them to be, you know, like 2X or so with their ownership would be otherwise in large field tournaments. Do you think that applies to this Baltimore team though? Because I, I find it hard to believe that they would be like 25 to 30% owned individually, but they're so much more popular in ownership projections. It does typically end up being the case. I'm just not sure on this spot. I do. I definitely see it because okay. it's a pricing thing. Their their top stacked score is right in line with the Braves, the Dodgers, the Yankees. They're a lot cheaper than those teams, and they're good for DFS purposes. They're facing a struggling Alec Marsh. I do. I think they'll be twenty five to thirty percent at least. Their their top guys in tournaments. They're just easy to roster on a slate where a lot of the good off- offenses are not easy to roster. All right, maybe I'll go towards Toronto then. If I could be convinced that Baltimore is going to be 25 to 30% owned in single entry, then I don't have to be worried about Toronto and what their ownership might be. Like if Toronto- I agree with that. Right around 10% owned in single entry, I feel good about them. I just didn't want to roster Toronto hitters in single entry for them to be like 15% owned or anything like that. So I would say, uh, yeah, Toronto and Oakland, those are my two highest considerations for uh, single entry contests for uh, today. And just going to double check Discord to make sure we didn't miss anything. And we did get one question here from Einsteinium. He wants to know, are the Twins a team that we're interested in stacking today, Matt? Not really. You mentioned Flaherty struggles, but this uh, this Twins lineup is atrocious. On any given night, anything can happen. But they're way down in the top stack tool. I think, and this is kind of a uh, a nice segue into the comment I was just about to make. 
the offense that I think that we haven't mentioned that's worth looking at against a chalky pitcher, as much as I hate to say this, is Texas. For all the reasons that you talked about why you wouldn't want to use sale and cash games, the fact that they're right in between the Yankees and Royals in our top stack tool, and there's a lot of leverage going against sale. I like sale. He's looked good this year, but we've certainly seen him get blown up before, and Texas's lineup is really good. So, no, I don't have interest in Minnesota, but I do have slight interest in Texas against a chalk pitcher. You know, while neither of them are primary stacks for me, they are low-owned enough to where I am overweight, actually, to each of Texas as well as Minnesota. Not, like, crazy, but I'm, like, 1.5x sure. the field on each of these stacks. We have Texas projected for 6% ownership. I have them in 9% of lineups. We've got Minnesota projected for 5% ownership. I have them in 8% of lineups. So just based on, and this is largely because of what the ownership is on these pitchers, but yeah, if I had to pick one pitcher to stack against four strict leverage purposes, it would be Jack Flaherty because if I look at all the pitchers on the slate that are picking up a bunch of ownership, we've got four of them. We've got Joe Ryan, not, not really all that interested in stacking the Tigers against him. We've got the Cardinals going up against Freddie Peralta, not all that interested in stacking the Cardinals in this spot either. But we've got the Twins going up against Jack Flaherty, the Rangers going up against Chris Sale. Like make cases for each of them. The Rangers, it's going to be this is a very good offense going up against a pitcher who is also good, but super popular. And then you got a Twins offense, which is not particularly good, but also going up against a not very good pitcher. Of the pitchers that are really popular, I think it's inarguable that Jack Flaherty is the worst one. And that is something that leads me to want to get to a little bit of the Twins offense here. I do like them as a leverage stack. That's fair. You're playing against Flaherty because, like, my counter would be the Twins' offense is not nearly as good as Texas. So that washes away for me how much, you know, better sale is than Flaherty. You can look at it a ton of different ways, though. The other team, that really low ownership that I want to talk about before we head out here, I mentioned Yariel Rodriguez for the Blue Jays, how I liked him as an arm. He comes in with a ton of unknown. As I mentioned, didn't pitch at all last year, came out of the bullpen the year before. The Padres. They're going to be very low owned. They have a lot of upside up and down their lineup. And you just don't know what you're getting with Rodriguez. Padres are in the middle of our top stack tool projected for 5% ownership. They're interesting to me. Um, Cause after Baltimore, there are no like slam dunks, which is why I think Baltimore will get that ownership. Yeah. It's uh, it's a lot of ownership going to Baltimore, not to rehash what it is that we've already talked about. But before we head out here, we're going to do some dong picks. Also going to let you guys know that if you want to sign up for Odd Shopper, our betting product, our betting site over oddshopper.com, you get access to, to Odd Shopper for $1 right now when you sign up with the promo code playoffs. So we've got the stochastic deal going on, 50% off the Sims for the NBA playoffs starting. And we've also got it for Odd Shopper as well. Just $1, get access to Odd Shopper, get bets for all the sports that are out there, all different kinds of markets in there. Check it out. It's only $1, and it's something that I think you guys really should be checking out. This is a great way to get your foot in the door. $1 for a week of Odd Shopper. Let's do our dong picks now, Matt. Who are you picking to go, who are you picking to go yard today? Our usual rule of thumb is no Coors Field game, but hey, that game's the, they've already taken care of it for us. So Matt, who are you picking at a home run? I am going to pick, this is completely off the board, Randy Arozarania. Let's see. Where do I want to go? Hmm. All right. I found it. My most rostered Oakland A's hitter. That's what I was looking for. Seth Brown. Seth Brown is in 21% of my lineups. I have a bunch of Oakland hitters that are in like 10 to 20% of lineups, way overweight to a lot of them, Seth Brown. That is going to be my home run pick of the day. And we got some home run picks coming in from chat as well. We've got a uh, Michael Roundtree is going with uh, Cronenworth. Malukar going with Giancarlo Stanton. He, he can never be upset with somebody picking Giancarlo Stanton. against a lefty. So I think that's a good pitch by a good pick by Malukar there. Sotex is going with Mookie Betts. Uh, we've got uh, Haunted Joe picked uh, Noda. Sports Guy 24 is going with Austin Riley there. So we've got uh, lots of uh, lots of different picks so far that are uh, coming. And Ryan Oda also is a, another Oakland A in there. We got Arca Fels is going with Yandy Diaz. Game on, let's go. Dalton Varsho. And we've got uh, Josh Naylor from really shouldn't be playing. Paul Goldschmidt from Andre Beagle taking Paul Goldschmidt against, against Freddie Peralta today. 
Ryan Rennebaum going the with Cardinals have Smith, owned Anthony him. Masilli has got Pete Alonzo. And then finally, David Wayne there is going with Vinny Pascantino. So, guys, thank you very much for watching. If you've not done yet, like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Links for everything below in the description box. Right after this is going to be NBA Live Before Lock. And then again, tonight with Josh, we're going to be sweating out the games over on playback. The NBA play-in games should be some really fun games today. So check out that and sweat the games alongside with us. We'll be doing some betting across the shows. We're talking about DFS, sweating our lineups, all that. So hope to see you guys later. Other than that, guys, thank you very much for watching. See you in a little bit. Peace out.